Good evening, everyone. A very warm welcome to you and thanks for joining us for this webinar all about potholes. My name is David Perrett and I'm part of the communications team here at Wiltshire Council. I'm joined here today by Councillor Caroline Thomas, Cabinet Member for Transport, Samantha Howe, Director of Highways and Transport, Chris Clark, Head of Local Highways and David Thomas, Head of Highways Asset Management. Before we start, I'm going to give you a quick introduction to how this webinar will work and then we'll get straight on with the session. If you wish to see closed captions of speakers' words, then please cl click on the CC button on the bottom right of your screen and they should then appear after 30 seconds or so. The system can take a little while to get warmed up. If you're having any technical problems, the most common solution is to switch it off and switch it on again. So please close Teams or your browser, reopen it and click on the meeting link again that was sent through earlier. Other problems may be down to your home internet connection. If you're hearing it an echo, it may be that you have this event open in two or more windows. You're welcome to submit a question to be answered using the chat function, and please also leave your name. Please keep your questions general about the way we manage highways and potholes rather than specific questions about individual highways defects. The best way to report potholes and other defects is through the My Wilts app. I'll post the link in the chat shortly. Our presenters will verbally answer as many questions as they're able to this evening. Many of you also submitted questions before the event, and we will aim to answer as many of these as we can today too. You should be able to see the slides on your screen and over on the other side, you should be able to see the Q&A panel. For some of you, it may be beneath your screen and you'll need to scroll down to see it. You, you may need to click on the icon of two overlapping speech bubbles to over open this panel. We will also use this panel to make any announcement and post useful links. Finally, I just need to make you aware that this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be uploaded to YouTube after the event. However, the only the only faces and voices that will be heard and seen in the video are those of the presenters. Anyone attending the webinar won't be seen or heard, though their questions may be read out. Now we move on to the agenda for this evening. I'll shortly hand over to Councillor Caroline Thomas, Cabinet Member for Transport, to introduce the webinar. Then Samantha Howe, Director of Highways and Transport, will talk about the background to the current pothole situation in Wiltshire. Next, Chris Clark, our Head of Local Highways, will explain what we're doing to fix potholes and then David Thomas, Head of Asset Management and Commissioning, will discuss how we approach asset management. Finally, we'll hold the question and answer session. I'll now hand over to Councillor Thomas to introduce the webinar. Apologies, Caroline, you're, you're, you're muted. So. I'll unmute myself. <laughs> OK, I'm sorry about that. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this webinar all about potholes. At Wiltshire Council, we know just how passionate people are about potholes, and that's why we're holding this webinar uh, to enable you to find out how potholes are inspected, prioritised and filled throughout the county as well as provide information on our longer term maintenance schedules and answer some follow up queries. Now, I know we've had some responses to this webinar along the lines of you should be filling potholes, not talking about them. But I can assure you that no money or practical resource has been diverted from work being undertaken on the ground. And I do think it's really important that we explain what we're doing with the funding we have. And hopefully this webinar will do just that. So I'll now hand you over to Samantha Howe, our Director of Highways and Transport. Thank you, Caroline. Um, good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for taking the time to join us this evening. Um, I'm sure you'll be aware that road conditions across the country, not just in Wiltshire, have suffered badly with the particular dry and hot summer of last year, um, and then by the very wet autumn and two prolonged periods of particularly cold weather um, earlier in the year. As Caroline has said, this has been recognised by government um, and recently we received confirmation that Wiltshire had been awarded an extra £3.6 million to undertake pothole repairs this year. This additional grant funding is beyond our structural maintenance allocation, which is over £21 million. And I'd like to reassure you this evening, we are working incredibly hard to maintain the network and ensure value for money. 
We have over 2,700 miles of road to maintain in Wiltshire, and this is in addition to our footpaths, cycleways, bridges. Um, and with an ageing and growing asset, the first thing I would encourage you to do when you spot a pothole is um, report it. You can do this by making a note of the location and um, reporting the pothole, ideally through my Wilts app or via the website. One of our highway engineers can then inspect the pothole and it will be graded in accordance with our highway safety inspection manual. Um, Chris Clark will tell you a little bit more about this shortly. Um, I must say we are aware of some frustrations with the My Wills app, um, particularly in terms of feedback to residents, and this is something we are currently working on. The council is committed to continuous improvement um, with the My Wills app, and please be assured all of your reports um, are directed to the right operatives. And as I say, if the pothole meets our intervention criteria, it will be fixed as quickly as possible. We may undertake a temporary repair if the pothole is an immediate risk to road safety, or we will undertake a permanent repair. As I say, your reports um, help us not only take the repairs, but they're also really important in terms of identifying hotspots on the network where we are seeing the greatest rates of deterioration. So talking specifically uh, about the challenges we're facing at the moment, um, we have seen an unprecedented increase in the number of pothole reports this year. Usually um, we see between 700 to 900 reports in the winter uh, month, but in January alone this year, we received over 4,000 pothole reports. To address this, we substantially increased our resources undertaking repairs by redeploying teams from other works, for example, our parish stewards. As much of the work we undertake in highway maintenance is seasonal, we were able to do this without detrimentally impacting um, other programmes of work. Um, as I say, the weather has been extreme and the next slide just captures the extremes we've seen in sort of a 12 month period. Last summer, we saw road temperatures in excess of 55 degrees um, and this was followed, as I said, by a very wet autumn and then road temperatures fell to minus nine degrees um, during two prolonged um, cold periods. In some senses, this is the perfect conditions for potholes to, to form. Um, we are working, as I say, incredibly hard to address this, and we've already started our planning for next winter. This is something that Dave Thomas will say a little bit more about later. But firstly, I'll hand you over to Chris Clark, who's going to explain how our pot are inspected, prioritised and filled. Thank you, Sam. Uh, well, if I, I start off with uh, what the, the document that forms the basis of our approach to uh, the maintenance and reactive maintenance. Section 41 of the Highways Act 1980 presents us with a duty to maintain the highway. Now, the methodology that we use to do that is laid out in the Highways Inspection Manual. This document basically categorises um, our road network into three groups effectively and prioritises defects based on severity and the category of road. Can I have the next slide, please? We do pick up an awful lot of um, comment in relation to interim repairs um, and the perception that these fell very quickly and it's not necessarily a cost effective method of operating. So what I want to try to do is lay out why we go about uh, our business and, and actually do interim repairs. As Sam uh, touched upon, December of last year, we were at around 900 potholes touch over um, for that month. Then we had that cold spell and really there was an explosion of potholes. We jumped to over 4,000 pothole reports. Now we have to react to that um, and we've also got to make the road safe for users and to do so in the correct time frame um, as far as uh, the period that is set out in our inspection manual. For the most severe uh, defects we're looking at a period of 24 hours from us categorising it to actually making a repair or making it safe. To do that um, across 4,000 potholes would take an immense, immense resource to do so. So, and to do a, a permanent repair. So, what we've got to do is actually undertake an interim repair whereby the pothole is filled and actually it renders the surface safe. 
this provides us with a period of time whereby we can then look to um, program in our resources more efficiently and make permanent repairs. What I do have to say though is well there is a perception that all of our pothole repairs done in this manner fail very quickly. Actually they don't. Some do which is a nature of filling uh, a pothole in very wet cold conditions. Um, it can mean that uh, the durability of it is affected and that can fail. However, if we're able to fill potholes, a number of them do actually stay in there and some of the interim repairs can stay in place for many years. Um, we do monitor that and we look at how we can improve the approach that we take. Next slide, please. So what we have here is um, how we fill potholes um, and a bit of an infographic uh, as far as the approach that we take. Uh, now, sort of our teams will cut out where we are undertaking a permanent repair of the pothole. Um, and we look to remove any of the loose material, uh, any of the sort of, uh, moisture uh, water that is left in the hole is brushed out along with any debris. We next add a bonding coat uh, or tack coat as it's known uh, in the business as it were. This improves the bond between the material that is going in there and the existing surface and prevents water ingress along the joint lines. We will then fill the hole with an approved material. Now, that can be a proprietary cold lay material and that can um, also be a hot material um, from a quarry or stored in one of our depots in a hot box. Now the level that we fill the pothole to is surcharge slightly above the level so that when we get round to the next stage which is uh, compacting the uh, material there it's done so um, without creating a, a dip in the surface. It's always a challenge to try and get that right where you're doing small areas it can create something of a ride quality issue but we tend to um, look at that as preferable than uh, having the hole left there in situ. And following the sort of uh, completion of that, then we'll tidy the site up, remove any debris and move on to the next site. Next slide, please. Now, a little bit more about permanent repairs. What we are looking at um, is that piece of equipment that you can see in the uh, top of the slide there, which is a skid steer uh, machine with a front milling attachment on it. What that will do is enable us to cut patches out, um, which you can see below in a square, tidy fashion. Um, it it's also very good because it prevents um, operatives having to gun out the material with uh, a breaker pack. Um, so it prevents uh, what we call hand arm vibration syndrome for uh, the guys doing the work. It's also much quicker to operate in that way. Then what we would look to do generally with this uh, size of patch that you can see there is use a hot material um, to replace the material that we've milled out. Um, that is laid generally by hand, um, but for perhaps some of the larger areas we'll, we'll look at a mini plate paving machine to undertake that work. Next slide. I think that is on to David. So uh, handing over to you, David, uh, for your piece on asset management. Hey, thank you, Chris. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to give you a brief overview of what we mean by highway maintenance. While pothole repair is one item of our maintenance work, it's important to remember that highway maintenance overall also covers a number of other areas. 
So these include resurfacing of roads and footways, repairing bridges and other structures such as retaining walls, um, drainage systems, road signs and markings, traffic signals and street lights. The way we go about this is covered under the three headings you see in front of you on screen. First one is reactive maintenance. Um, this approach involves responding to issues as they arise, such as repairing potholes or replacing damaged signs. Reactive repairs are primarily driven from our scheduled inspections, but also public reports such as those via the MyWilts app. Uh, as Chris has um, set out, when assessing the defects, we apply the intervention levels um, set out in our highways inspection manual. Second category is planned maintenance. Um, this approach involves scheduling regular maintenance tasks to prevent issues from arising in the first place or from getting worse. For example, regular road resurfacing or bridge inspections to identify and address issues before they become serious. Planned maintenance generally covers a forward 12 month program of activity. The third category is asset management. Um, this approach involves taking a much longer term view of highways maintenance and involves evaluating the condition of the roads and infrastructure and prioritizing maintenance tasks based on factors like condition, safety, cost and rates of deterioration. So to illustrate this, um, I would use our countywide carriageway resurfacing program. Uh, we undertake annual road condition scanner surveys using vehicle mounted lasers. The data collected is analyzed through our um, specialist HIAM software with each length of carriageway being scored based upon the level of defect and deterioration rate found. Um, the system also helps with the identification of the appropriate treatment type um, to make it better. The scored list is then subject to engineer appraisal and site inspection to confirm the HIAMS recommendations and a final program is developed. Currently the program looks ahead over a forward seven year period but it is subject to annual review and updating. So next slide please. So as Caroline mentioned a little earlier, um, in recognition of the deterioration of the highway network nationally through the 22-23 winter period, the Department for Transport has made available an additional grant of £3.684 million to the Council to help address carriageway condition. We are approaching this by identifying those locations subject to the highest levels of deterioration in surface condition. We're doing this by using pothole repair records and customer pothole reports. And from these, we are able to produce a heat map of the county to identify the worst areas. And our works programme um, for this funding will be based around this. We will be sharing full details of this quite shortly within the next couple of weeks, um, but we actually anticipate uh, work starting on the ground late summer, early autumn, and we hope to um, address the worst areas of county before the winter period sets in. So that concludes our presentation and we now come to the question and answer part of tonight's webinar. So uh, Councillor Thomas, Sam, Chris and myself will do our best to respond to as many questions as we can, but all questions from this evening will be collated and, will be, and we will be providing written responses on our website. So at this point, I'll hand back to David. Thank you very much, David. Um, so as um, previously stated, um, many of you sent uh, questions in beforehand and um, we will look to answer as many as we can. Um, you can also use the chat function, the Q&A function to um, ask questions and we'll get to as many of, of those as we can um, tonight as well. So starting off um, with a pre-submitted question, um, I think this one is probably best for you, Dave. Um, so um, what is the budget for potholes this year and how does this compare with the previous 10 years? OK, thanks, David. Um, this year, our overall structural maintenance block allocation is £20.727 million. Pounds. We have set aside a, an amount of money for potholes, but because that is a reactive service, 
we can't define at this point how much money we will actually spend on potholes. It all depends on how the network progresses. But to give you an idea, um, last year, our overall budget for structural maintenance was just over £23 million, made up of um, £20.7 million of Department for Transport grant money with a little bit of carryover funding from previous years. And of that £23 million, um, we spent £2.3 million directly on filling potholes. Um, in comparison to year, many years ago, um, 10 years ago, our overall structural maintenance budget stood at around £12 million a year. So we have had a substantial increase um, in the available funding made to, to us over the last 10 years. Hope that helps. Thanks very much, Dave. Um, uh, the next question is for Samantha. Um, and it's, uh, why can parish councils not have uh, road repair buckets or kits to fill potholes themselves? Thank you, David. I can fully understand this question, but I must say the council's local highway authority is responsible for maintaining the highway network in Wiltshire, with the exception of the strategic road network, for example, the A36 and the A303, which is um, the responsibility of national highways. We have a statutory responsibility to maintain the highway and we would not endorse anyone repairing a pothole themselves. Um, different locations require different types of traffic management to ensure that road users and indeed people completing the potholes are safe um, and if a parish council were to do so um, they would become liable for any problems or indeed any accidents that may occur. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is for Chris um, and it's is it possible for the edges of roads in certain areas where the tarmac breaks away to be permanently filled with hard concrete so there is no need for the edges of roads to be repeatedly filled again? In the new forest this method has been used successfully, thus avoiding repeat repairs and saving vast amounts of money in the long run. OK, th uh, thanks, David. Um, well, within a rural county, we do have a significant uh, length of small, narrow lanes. Um, and over the years, we've seen an increase in the uh, number and size of uh, agricultural vehicles that are operating there. So it does have an effect whereby um, the edge of the road surface can deteriorate. Um, you'll be pleased to hear that we do have a programme of what we consider to be verge strengthening. Um, now, this is a approach where we are excavating out alongside the carriageway and to a certain degree into the edge of the carriageway as well. Uh, backfilling that area with a reclaimed granular material which is compacted in layers and that that really gives some uh, strength to the shoulder of the road uh, and what we tend to do is then rake the um, topsoil back in across the top of that because you've still got that material in place retaining the edge of the road um, why we do that is simply because uh, if we keep increasing the width of the road um, as cars get uh, farther and farther out, um, we, we're going to end up extending into the sort of uh, hedges either side of the road. Uh, and that's not something that we really feel is uh, the right thing to do. On occasions, though, we will resurface that uh, granular material with uh, a bituminous surface. Um, to sort of increase uh, its resistance to uh, the sort of uh, traffic utilising it. Um, but it is a challenge, as I say, for us, particularly in this rural county, county that we are. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, and the next question is for Councillor Thomas. So um, this person asks, why uh, do some potholes take so long to repair? For example, they reported um, one back in February and it was fixed in May. Thanks. Well, yes, it is very frustrating, isn't it, when you've gone to the effort of, uh, of reporting something through my wilts and, uh, and you don't see it getting sorted out fairly quickly. Uh, essentially, it's because when we receive a pothole report, it gets assessed by an engineer and it's given a priority. Um, and those priorities are based on what are called defect criteria um, and they're laid out. Those defect criteria are laid out in the Highways Safety Inspection Manual. 
incidentally, it has been flagged that that's not an easy document to find. So um, I think we ought to make sure that is uh, easier to find and, I'll, and I'll, ask, um, I'll ask our guys to have a look at that. But the point is not all reported hot holes do actually meet the defect criteria, and so um, they won't be repaired. Um, but hopefully they will be picked up at a later date through other maintenance programs. Um, we aim to fix what are called priority one potholes by the end of the next day. Priority two, um, we give up to 14 days. Priority three, up to 28 days. Priority four, 60 days. And the priority five ones are referred to, um, to, a, to a manager for further consideration. And essentially we, we, we have to prioritise um, because we've got Inevitably, um, we don't have you know finite resources, um, and we have to make sure they're they're working on the um, on the top priority matters. Thank you very much, Caroline. And um, yes, I've posted a link to the um, Highway Safety Inspection Manual in the chat, but I'll also um, I'm, I'm also going to post um, our kind of potholes page, and uh, I'll make sure it's more prominent on on there as well. Um, in the coming days because that's where we'll um, also post um, a recording of this webinar and also the full Q&A as well. So um, the next question is for Chris and I think we might have covered this Chris but it won't hurt to go over it again. It's, it's um, how is work prioritised um, and this person says one can imagine priorities given to high volume roads but the impact on residents of small villages is equally severe. Right, OK, well, re repeating uh, what Caroline's just said, we, we do um, rely very heavily on the safety inspection manual to set out the categories and priorities that we will undertake repairs to. Um, it is a fact that um, as far as risk is concerned, where uh, the, the roads are busier, there is an increased risk uh, to the road user simply because there's more people using it. So it can be that it may feel that uh, rural roads are not getting uh, a fair crack of the whip, but we do actually look at those as well. It's just that actually where there is heavy traffic, uh, the road tends to deteriorate much quicker uh, and we tend to focus a little more on that um, rather than rural roads. But uh, as I say, please be assured that we, we don't forget about the situation with uh, rural roads. Thank you, Chris. Um, the next uh, question is for Dave and, and this has come up a few times actually. It's, um, does the council seek compensation from utility companies for repairs they have made um, due to poor reinstatement work carried out by these companies? If not, why not? Thanks, David. Um, yes, uh, Wiltshire Council is a permitting authority, so each utility um, provider has to get a permit to um, open any works on the highway in Wiltshire, so we control it that way. Um, in terms of utility uh, reinstatements, um, the quality of the reinstatement is set out in national codes that they have to abide by. Uh, the, we inspect those once the work has been done to ensure that they're up to the correct standard. Um, we get a guarantee period from the utility companies. Generally, those guarantees are up to two years in duration and any defects that occur within that two year period the utility company has to put that right at their expense. However, if um, on occasion when a utility company doesn't respond uh, as we would want, we do have the power to go in and make repairs to those utility trenches ourselves. And in those circumstances, we do make a full recharge to those utility companies. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, next one is for Chris. Um, we touched on this previously, but why don't parish stewards carry out more permanent repairs to reported potholes rather than the temporary me measures that need to be repaired repeatedly? Um, I think uh, the answer to that really lies in the fact that the parish steward is a single man or woman um, operating system. There is only one of them. Um, working at a time in an area. Um, so what we then have is the fact that doing permanent repairs and 
uh, the slide I showed you earlier on actually sort of showed a, a fairly hefty piece of equipment that's used to undertake some of those permanent repairs. Um, it, it's just that, as I say, it's a single person operating rather than a gang. So what we do is we, we rely on the parish stewards to undertake those interim reinstatements. And as I sort of mentioned earlier on, the interim reinstatements can actually be quite durable in last years in many cases. And also what we use those stewards for is to highlight where there are areas of potholes. They can either carry out find and fix or report it in to us uh, for further uh, works to be carried out. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is for Sam um, and it's about compensation claims. So it's, why does it take almost six months for Wiltshire Council to process compensation claims for damage caused to taxpayers' vehicles by road defects? Thank you, David. Um, I appreciate it feels like um, an incredibly long time um, if your vehicle has been damaged by a road defect. Um, but it is incredibly important that when dealing with expenditure of public funds, we make sure we are doing so in a prudent manner and we only do um, so where we are sure we are liable as a council. Um, unfortunately, it's a really sad fact that proportion of the claims that our insurance team receive are fraudulent. So we have to undertake due diligence to make sure that um, where we are liable for a claim, we are paying and where we are not, we are uh, challenging that through the appropriate means. I hope that helps. Thank you very much. Um, next question for Chris. Um, I heard that a pothole has to be four inches deep before you fill it. Is this true? No, that, that, that's, that's not the case. What we look to do is actually undertake repairs um, that are warranted by the inspection manual. Um, what we say is for a, a P1, it's 75 mil deep. Um, which is just under three inches. Um, potholes that are deeper than 40 mil are priority two defects, and we will look to repair those um, within 14 days. The difficulty that we have is that some of those um, defects that are less than 40 mil uh, provide us with challenges to repair simply because the material that we actually are able to use to repair them uh, can fret out because the material is quite thin at that point. Um, so in which case we're then looking at a, sort of a more major repair and looking to put it into a planned maintenance programme. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is for Councillor Thomas on the My Wilts app. It's, um, so on My Wilts, I, I think I can only report one pothole at a time. This is very annoying if there are eight very bad potholes in close proximity. How can we get around this? Yes, I agree. It can be it can be annoying. And all I can all I can say is, is assure you that um, when a pothole is reported to us, it is inspected by an engineer and that engineer will look around and about in the in the immediate local vicinity uh, to see if there are other defects um, that can be treated uh, at the same time. So we do indeed look left and right up and down the highway uh, to, 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 you know, to make good use, uh, effective use of the resources when they go and visit that particular pothole. Thank you very much. Um, we've had quite a few questions come in this evening, so I'm going to take a couple of those now. So um, the first one is from uh, Julia Ford. It's um, once a road is designated, re designated for resurfacing has overrun and subsidence, will this be repaired separately? Sure. Was that one for Dave or Chris? Do you want me to take that one? Yeah. Uh, right. Um, I guess that's around um, structural uh, failures within the road where it's subsiding, dropping down. Um, what we would look to do, um, dependent on what the situation uh, on the site is, is actually undertake a repair that uh, deals with the, the complete problem so that it, there may need to be a structural repair undertaken where we 
dig down um, sort of to a depth uh, and remove some of the granular material, increase the overall thickness of the road. However, um, what we do on a, some occasions is actually increase the thickness of uh, the bituminous uh, material that we're installing there uh, to, to increase the strength of it, which isn't necessarily a permanent solution, but it will give us some time to consider what uh, larger measures that can be taken to deal with it. It may be that we have to use some uh, a gabion structure uh, to retain the wall. It tends to have or to retain the wall, so the, the road, sorry. It tends to be in areas where um, you've got ditch lines or the uh, edge of the carriageway runs away uh, down a slope. So um, we try to employ different measures uh, and resurface where we can, but actually look at the structural element as a problem separately. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is from Kirsty, and um, it's if a pothole has been repaired, how do you assess the question of the satisfaction stroke quality of the repair? Chris, is that one for you again? I think it probably is. Um, we, we have a process whereby we monitor the works of our contractor. It's not possible for us to inspect every single pothole um, that is repaired, but we, our technicians and engineers will monitor repairs and check to see that they are done on a, a sample basis to a standard that we would expect. We do have to factor in at times though that uh, some repairs undertaken in extreme weather uh, where it's been icy and, and there's been snow on the ground um, may not be as durable as what we would wish them to be. Uh, but as I say, it's a case of taking a sample uh, inspection out there of what has been repaired uh, uh, and when it was undertaken. Thank you very much. Um, this is this is from Chris, um, and I think Dave, you can answer this one. Hopefully, um, it's uh, why do residential streets seem to get less attention than town centres? Thanks, David. Yeah, I think it's. Um, as has been said in the chat um, already, um, residential areas, lower levels of traffic, lower levels of, of, of movement of people, town centres, um, much busier places, higher volumes of traffic and people. And so the categorisation within the inspection manual gives those areas um, a higher priority. Thank you very much. And the next one uh, touches on cycling, which is something that's come up a few times. So um, this this one says you will appreciate that potholes within a meter of the curb are deadly for cyclists. If we are trying to encourage people out from their cars, it would be better. It, it will be a better use of resources and make it, it and it would save money by concentrating on repairing a one meter strip out from the curb. Could the council consider this? I'm not sure who wants to take that one. I'll, I'll give that a go. <laughs> um, as I ride a bike quite frequently, um, I would say that it's something that we would look at um, as part of our uh, inspection process. The inspection manual guides us, um, but um, it's a fact that what tends to happen is where roads deteriorate, the edge closest to the curb line or, or the sort of um, verge tends to be the area where it picks up um, the most sort of defects and, and potholes. Uh, so we, we tend to pick that up um, as part of the inspection manual anyway, I would say. Thank you, Chris. Um, I think this one um, is for Sam. Um, it's from Karen Cannings. It's, why is it so difficult to accurately pinpoint on the My Wilts app map when trying to report a pothole?
Thank you, David, and thank you for the question. Um, we, we appreciate the My Wilts app it is evolving, and as I've said before, um, we, we understand there's some frustrations with it and we are looking to uh, improve it. One of the challenges is the way the, the app um, corresponds with the uh, internal systems we use, and one of the improvements we're expecting to see over the summer is a, a pinpoint accuracy in terms of location and also where we've notified where there's multiple reports, um, a better process for being specific. Um, so I would say, uh, please bear with us. Um, I know it's a bit challenging at the moment, but the MyWalks app is certainly evolving. Um, and with our new contractors, we are uh, looking at better data and better performance management, particularly in terms of specific location data. So I hope that helps. Thank you very much. Um, and the next question I think is for Dave um, and it's from Kirsty. It's um, I live in an area where there are many quarries. A huge amount of road damage is clearly caused by the lorries that use the quarries. Do the quarry companies pay towards the road usage in their operating counties? OK, thanks uh, for the question. Um, no, we don't get any direct funding from the road user itself. Um, uh, the road users, uh, the haulage companies, they pay their road tax along with everything else. That money goes into central government. Um, we get an allowance or a grant money each year from the Department for Transport, um, but that no way matches the overall income that is generated through um, vehicle taxing system. So the, the quick answer is no, we don't receive any direct funding from the users of the highway. Thank you very much. Um, and um, this is this one is from Chris that says, um, are any technologies coming on stream that will enable longer lasting surfaces? I'm not sure. Is that one for you, Chris? Yeah, um, there are many new technologies um, that are out there and many of them will actually improve uh, durability of surfaces, um, be it uh, polymer modified uh, binders, um, different types of aggregate uh, being used um, within this sort of surfacing. Um, generally, the way that we lay um, bitmac hasn't changed considerably over the years. Um, there has been um, more emulsion type surfaces coming in um, and different types of surface dressing. Again, a lot of that is done around the um, modification of the binder that is used um, sort of for surface dressing. So yes, there are um, attempts to improve that situation by deploying um, technology uh, into uh, the surfacing sort of uh, business as it were. Um, I think there's still a long way to go on that. Thanks, Chris. And um, I've, I've, I've got another one for you here. <laughs> this is from Dave, who says, how long do you expect permanent repairs to last and why do some potholes develop again quickly? It's, um, well, uh, permanent repairs um, should be lasting in the order of years. Um, now, when I talk about years, I would say dependent on traffic flows, you're talking eight to ten years potentially. However, what we do have to factor in is whether there is underlying issues with the surface, whether traffic flows are changing, increasing uh, and that type of thing. So it's, it's difficult to say um, sort of exactly how long a sort of permanent pair should be lasting, other than it is a say it's in the order of years. Potholes can um, form quickly following um, sort of a repair um, in the surface. A lot of times that happens where we have an area uh, outside the area that we've surfaced or resurfaced and uh, the the older material has started to deteriorate. The fact that we've introduced the joint also increases the weakness in the uh, surfacing matrix uh, and you can end up with losing material out of the uh, surrounding uh, bitmac. Now 
also comes into play if um, there are issues over workmanship and you know we won't run away from that um, that can happen and we look to address that with our contractor when it does uh, but there's a multitude of reasons why it can happen I've mentioned as well um, if we're laying um, material in particularly in clement weather that can also have a detrimental effect uh, on durability as well Thanks very much, Chris. Um, next one is for Dave. Um, uh, where where a road surface is in very poor condition but doesn't meet the pothole criteria, what's the council's approach for this? In those circumstances, we would uh, most likely pick up that deterioration in the service in, in the annual surveys that we do, and it would enter into the longer term programme uh, and be picked up as part of the overall priori prioritisation of surfacing sites um, across the county. Um, as well as that, because we only do our surveys on an annual basis, if we find that we get rapid deterioration in a road surface that needs to be addressed um, in between the publication of our annual um, programmes, the local highways teams are able to do um, reactive patching type works over larger areas. Um, so similar treatment to a pothole, but a much larger patch um, area to, to take account of extended um, areas of deterioration. So the, the longer term is that it will be picked up as part as one of our, our, our programmed surfacing schemes, but if it's um, if it's a particular issue, then it should be picked up by the local highways teams and addressed that way. Thanks very much, Dave. Um, I noticed that we've had in the chat some questions regarding uh, specific uh, places in Wiltshire and specific pot road defects. Um, I don't think we'll be able to answer those specific questions this evening, but um, we will take those away and um, get them published on the website. Um, of which I posted the link in, in the in the chat, so we we can we can do that um, outside of this webinar. Um, I'm now going to go back to the pre-submitted questions. Uh, so um, this one is for Dave. Uh, are subcontractors paid per pothole? Um, no, they're not. Our contractors who undertake pothole work for us, um, we employ them on, on a resource basis. Basically, we pay a gang cost. Um, on a on a weekly basis, what we actually then do is monitor the performance of that gang to ensure that they're um, repairing a reasonable number of potholes per week, and the performance levels are are at the uh, level that we would be that we're happy with. Thanks very much. Um, the next question, I think we've answered. It's about um, it's about the differences in in. Uh, the types of a pothole fill. Uh, so this next one is for Sam. Um, is there any compensation to vehicle owners with pothole damage, noting that damage may be accumulated and not just attributable to a single instance? Um, in, in short, no, uh, I'm afraid a claim can only be based on a single instance. Thank you very much. Um, the, the, I'm going to take. We've we've had we've had a question come in um, from an anonymous user this evening, um, and it's uh, why does Wiltshire Council consider it acceptable to fill in road fill defects in a, in a paved road areas with tarmac? And only does this look shoddy in the context of historic towns where the defect has been caused by heavy vehicles. It does not last and creates an uneven surface. So um, I don't know. Is that one one for you, Chris? I'll, I'll try to answer that. Um, where um, you have flagstone paving, um, be it concrete or natural stone, um, there is a problem whereby those areas get run by vehicles. Um, the nature of that material is that it, it can crack um, under point loading of tyres. Um, and what that does mean is that um, we, we then have to undertake a repair. The way we go about doing that is if there is a immediate 
risk there and it falls into our um, highways inspection manual as a, a P1 or a um, P2, we'll look to potentially undertake a repair using tarmac to make the area safe. And then we will return to actually replace that with a stone um, flagstone. One of the issues that we have is that many of our high streets, uh, Chippenham, Royal Wooden Bassett, uh, for instance, two that I'm aware of, have uh, a York stone um, paving, a natural stone paving there. And to actually repair those, we do have to procure in replacement stone. Although we do have a stock of uh, stone that we're able to use, actually being able to get the right size stone um, can take us a little bit of time to sort out. So that it's important that we make it initially safe and then we can return to actually undertake a more permanent repair utilising the correct material. Thank you very much. Um, and, and another question come in this evening. This one's for Dave. Um, do the area boards have the opportunity to change the programme of surfacing works on lesser roads? Uh, yes, they do to some extent. Um, on an annual basis, um, we share our um, programmes with the area board and ask for local feedback. It is possible for the area boards to request that a scheme that might be in a year two or year three a part of the programme is brought forward into a year one. Um, we do try and be as flexible as possible, but it does mean that any scheme that is brought forward, um, we then have to um, knock back one of the schemes that is in the year one into a later year in the programme. So we do have to give that some careful thought, um, but we do try and take on board local requests. Thanks very much, Dave. And I've got another one for you now. Um, uh, this is about surface dressing, so it's probably best in your answer to explain what surface dressing is. But um, Karen Cannings asks, why does the county waste money undertaking surface dressing as the dressing usually gets pushed to the side of the road by passing traffic? OK, surface dressing is um, a thin surface course, so uh, uh, just a, a slurry kind of tar laid on the road with some stone rolled into it. The intention of surface dressing is to seal the carriageway surface um, to stop water penetrating through the carriageway into the underlying layers and causing further defects. Um, it is a cheaper treatment than full surfacing, but it can extend the life of a carriageway um, up to 15 years. Uh, and so it, we are tr always trying to balance the um, maintenance work that we're doing um, and get best use of the budget that we have available to us. So it's a bit like um, your own house at home. Um, if you're, uh, you might regularly decide to paint the windows of your house just to keep it looking smart uh, and to keep the wood in the windows all up together. The alternative is that you just wait for things to deteriorate to a level where you can't actually maintain it. You have to replace it. Um, so that's the basis of a surface dressing programme. Thanks very much, Dave. Um, I'm, I'm going to move back to the pre-submitted questions and um, there's quite a few that we've already covered off the answers to. So I'm going to skip ahead slightly and um, ask this one for Sam. So. Um, uh, and I, I believe you touched on this as well, Sam, but um, it's worth reiterating. So the My Wilts app is difficult to use. Are there plans to fix this? Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so uh, without repeating myself um, too much, um, we are conscious that there's some frustrations with the My Wilts app um, and we have been able to make service improvements in some parts of the Highways and Transport Directorate and we're very keen to ensure that these are replicated in terms of highway maintenance and in particular pothole reports. So um, we are working to improve the feedback um, loop to customers so that when residents or visitors uh, uh, have indicated that there are challenges um, on the network, 
they will understand when work is um, being undertaken and when it is completed. And I said in terms of being able to um, be more accurate about reporting, we are hoping to make those changes over the summer. Um, what I would say is um, reassure you that those reports when they come in through my works app um, immediately go to the right people in the council uh, and work is being undertaken and just um, please bear with us but keep reporting to us because all your feedback whether it be about highway maintenance issues or actually the system itself is really important thank you thank you very much um and uh just moving on to insurance claims so another one for you sam so um does the council claim on driver's insurance for damages caused e.g road signs destroyed by vehicles leaving the road are landowners responsible for the visibility of road signs on their property? Hedges being cut by a tractor often skip over road signs, leaving them obscured. Thank you. Um, yes, where driver details are, are known or indeed where we can find them after an incident, um, absolutely we pursue claims um, on, on insurance to make sure that um, damage is, is not publicly funded. It is um, liable to those individuals that have caused it. Thank you very much. Um, next one is for Chris. Um, are sunken drain covers or utilities covers treated as potholes? They are not treated as potholes because they're a different type of defect um, which is contained within the inspection manual. So yes, they will be picked up um, as a defect. So a, a repair should be arranged as long as it complies to uh, the intervention level set out in the inspection manual. Thank you very much. Um, uh, this one's for Sam uh, and it's about new technologies. So um, I've heard that Wiltshire may have a new miracle machine which can swiftly deal with village potholes using a hot fill. If this is so, how often might each village be able to access this machine? Thank you, David. Um, I wish there was a miracle cure for potholes, but but in short, um, there, there isn't. So as Chris and David both mentioned earlier, we, we look at uh, innovation uh, across the whole of the country. We're very uh, well used to um, conversations at a national level through our contractors and our consultancy partners uh, and also the work we do with national highways in terms of new technology. And in the past, we've undertaken um, trials and research projects, both with the Department for Transport, but also with um, private sector partners. Um, for example, we, we've undertaken um, trials into Pothole Spotter, Digital Inspector and um, Digital Brokerage. Some of that innovation work is um, reported in our annual report to Environment Select Committee, which is also available on the website. Um, and I should say that when considering all trials, we do need to be mindful of risks and the importance of delivering value for money, particularly when maintaining the extent of our network. You know, it is a big um, network in Wiltshire, as I said previously. So technology is moving very quickly and we need to make sure we're uh, making informed decisions. But um, in consultation with our contractors and with our partners, say so we are happy to try different things, but um, unfortunately there's no quick and one size doesn't fit, um, fit all. Thank you very much, Sam. So there's just a couple of minutes left. So I'm going to try and cover um, questions that we haven't uh, covered before, because many of them are, are sort of like the same things um, being requested. So um, I'm going to move on to Dave and um, it's uh, when maintenance work is scheduled or roads closed, is thought given to traffic and delays at peak times, i.e. school opening and closing times? Yes, very much so. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we are a permitting authority uh, and so anybody who wishes to occupy a space on the public highway to undertake works, be that ourselves, um, can other utility companies or developers, they have to get a permit from the council to allow them to occupy that space. That permit defines the start and finish dates of the occupation of the live carriageway. Um, that is monitored by um, inspectors to make sure that that is complied with. But certainly um, before we do any kind of road closure or temporary traffic management, um, we are more than aware of the surrounding network impacts on schools. Uh, and we also look to schedule the work to happen, sometimes overnight, sometimes evening works, um, sometimes during the day, but outside of the peak hours 
specifically to avoid um, overburdening the, the network and causing delay and disruption to the users. Thank you very much, Dave. And, and that's the final question this evening. But as I say, any that haven't been answered, we will be publishing on our website um, in the coming days. And um, I posted a, a link in the chat to that. So thank you once again for taking the time out to join us this evening and for your questions and comments. Uh, we hope you found it informative. Um, we'll up, as I say, we'll upload this webinar to YouTube and it will be available on our website in the next day or so. Um, I posted a, a link to that page in the chat and we'll also post the written Q&A that covers all the questions asked this evening on that page in the coming days. Thank you once again for joining us and have a good evening.